Wow. His life for mine. God is good. Amen. 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 God's good. Let's stand for the re I don't even know how I move forward then. I mean, it's, you know, whatever I, whatever we do now is just, you know, whatever we do now, just remember this moment just a minute ago when, you know, you'll be blessed when you leave out of here, right? Amen. So let's, uh, let's go to the book, uh, stand with me please for reading God's word book, of, uh, Romans chapter eight, verse one. We've looked at this passage of Scripture. I want to look at it again. I want to give you a couple of definitions I gave you last week again. Because I want to talk about, a, we're in a series for the next few weeks. I want to talk about an issue we all deal with. And that's the issue of guilt. Many of us deal with guilt. And I want you to look at this. Because what the Bible says in Romans 8.1. Uh, I'm reading from, teaching from the New American Standard. The King James, the wording will be just a little bit different, but we'll all end up in the same place together. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no what? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in who? Christ Jesus. All right, let's, let's all read that together. One, two, three, read. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, I want you to change it. We're going to read it one more time out loud, and we're going to change, um, uh, take out the words, those who, and put in me, okay? Ready? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for me. For me. Okay. There is there, therefore, now no condemnation for me because I am in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, speak to our hearts this morning. Let us hear your voice this morning. We've been blessed already if we don't do anything else. You died for us. What a great reminder through that song, your life for ours. Lord, speak to our hearts this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. So one other thing I want to talk to you about, do you ever feel just, maybe sometimes out of the blue, you just feel guilty about stuff. You wake up one day and, you know, you just feel this guilty. I began to deal with this probably two or three weeks ago is the reason why we're, we're talking about this today. For some reason, just out of the blue, I began, I woke up, began to feel guilty. And uh, the guilt that I dealt with that particular day was uh, a guilt twofold, guilt as a husband and guilt as a father. And I think back to the early part of the time when, when we very first got married, and you, all of you all that know when you very first get married, you know the struggle, especially when you get married as a young person. You know the struggles that all young people have when they get married. They're young. If you're 19, 20, 21, 22 years old, you get married and you, and you struggle. It's hard to make ends meet. You're, you're figuring out each other. You're, learning, you're coming from his home and her home and trying to mesh the two together, and then there's... You know, there's ultimately arguments and fussing, and then kids come along, and there's arguments and there's fussing. And I begin to, just for some reason, I had this overwhelming guilt as a failure as a husband uh, that I hadn't been, a, you know, and I, I recognize this, that I had that early on in our marriage, I wasn't as good as my, to my wife as I should be. And uh, in years since then, I've tried my best to correct that and to be the man that she deserves, uh, uh, a man that God has told me to be as a husband. and uh, But I was awful guilty. And then I felt guilty about the kids, that the kids had to grow up with a dad who wasn't able to do everything that uh, a regular dad can do because I've dealt with this back problem since I was 25 years old and I wasn't able to go out and play and do with the kids. Pam done a, a lot of that. It was overwhelming guilt, almost to the point of... <laughs> feeling like I was a failure. And then I had to stop for a minute and realize, now hold it, number one, I've dealt with the situ uh, with the, the past with Pam. I've, I have, she's forgiven me of me being a stupid young guy, doing stupid young guy things. And, you know, we've grown together and we've become, you know, a family that God, I think would be pleasing to God. And the kids understand that dad was hurt and couldn't do what they used to do. So where does this guilt come from? 
And I realized that at that point, I wasn't dealing with uh, the kind of guilt that makes you better. I was dealing with a kind of guilt that tries to tear you down. Have you ever had guilt come on you that tried to tell you, you know, about your past, about things that you've done, things that you've gone through that try to just tear you down and get you back into a place, you know, where you don't, well, did God really forgive me? Am I really a Christian? Should I, you know, should I go to church on Sunday? Because after all, look at the way I acted back, back then. But I am reminded that I needed to tell you that if you have dealt with that, if you've been born again, if you've con uh, confessed it, then it's all behind you. That is guilt that comes from the devil. So there's two types of guilt, uh, biblical guilt that I want you to be aware of. And if you want to, you wrote this down last week, you don't have to do it again. But if you didn't write this down last week, I want you to re be reminded and jot this down. Two types of guilt that you'll get. Number one is condemnation condemnation okay and I'll give you the definition in a second the, and the other one is called conviction condemnation and conviction condemnation number one uh, is comes from the devil with the the uh, purpose of driving you away from God okay so when you get as a believer when, when God when when you wake up and it comes against you and you feel like man I'm just an absolute failure I'm nobody I'm no good I'm nothing and, and you 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 wake up that way and you know you've been forgiven you know you you were baptized you know you made that decision understand that that comes from the devil and it's designed to get you away from God to get you depressed to get you think well I am no good I am nothing I am nobody that's what the devil wants. I want you to look at another passage of scripture. We looked at this again, but we'll look at it today. John 10.10. 10. Write that down and remember this one. John chapter 10 and verse number 10. The thief, who's the thief? Right Satan, the devil, our enemy, the great deceiver. The thief comes only to do what? Okay. Now, when the devil comes and puts condemnation up on you, when the devil comes and makes you feel guilty, he's got threefold purpose of dealing this with you. First of all, he wants to steal. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your peace. He wants to steal from you anything that's any resemblance of God. And so he'll make you feel guilty. Like, well, you know, you're done something wrong. Uh, you know, and it might be something that you've done, you know, 20, 30 years ago that you feel guilty about all of a sudden. And what this does is it dri you know, it drives you away from God. He wants to kill any resemblance of a future for you. He doesn't want you to be blessed. He doesn't want you to have a great future. He doesn't want you to live with an anticipation of what God can do and eventually if he can do it he'll destroy your life altogether all the way down to physically killing you and the more I think about the people who got in the tailspin spiral that they believed the lies of the devil and they got in the spiral where it just spiraled out of control and next thing their life is going a direction they never thought possible all because they believed the lie that was told to them. Maybe it was a young child growing up that told that they would never have nothing, never could be, never would. I told you the story. Some of y'all are new and never heard it. <clears throat> when I was a young pastor, I was probably 28, 29 years old, and uh, we had vacation Bible school at, at the church we served in Mount Sterling, and uh, we had a little girl come forward. She was probably 12, uh, 13 at the time. Uh, her name was Edith. I'll never forget who, forget her, forget her name. Uh, Edith came forward to Vacation Bible School and made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. Now, one of the things we always do with children is I never baptize a child or a young person unless I talk to their parents and make sure they're okay with it, you know, because then we can always get to them later. The main decision is they make Jesus the Lord of their life. Uh, and so this particular uh, little girl, she made a decision, and we went, me and a deacon went and talked to the family about Edith. We went to the house, and I sat down, and I talked about how glad we were to have Edith in our youth group and how Edith was a 
was a um, was a uh, you know growing in the Lord. She was a bright young lady with a bright future ahead of her, and and we were proud to have her. And we talked about uh, you know her decision to make Jesus Lord of her life. And the parents, mom and dad, sit there and listen to everything I said, and never said a word. And I said, Edith has made a decision to trust Jesus and we want to baptize her, but I don't want to do it without your permission. And sat there for a few minutes and they looked at me and they looked at Edith and they said, uh, the things he he is saying, Edith, can't be true. I thought that was odd. And they looked at Edith and said, you know, Edith, that you're too stupid to make a decision like that. Exact words. And I said, excuse me? They said, Edith, you know it, don't you? That you're not smart enough. You're not, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough to make that kind of decision to be saved. Now, there's a time, I have a saying that uh, around uh, the homestead there that sometimes you have to take off the pastor's hat. And sometimes I take off the pastor's hat and I'll just tell you the way it's going to be. And in that moment, I took off the pastor's hat and I let these people have it. Now, I'm not proud of the fact that I let them have it, but, but here's the thing. I said, look, maybe the only two stupid people that I see in the room this morning is a mom and dad that is dumb enough to talk to a child that way who is bright and has got a future, who's, who's got something that's, got, that's worth everything, and that's to make Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I said, matter of fact, Edith, if you want to be baptized, I don't care what they say. You come to church, and we'll baptize you. Well, fast forward 20 years now, I guess. Probably it's been 20 years ago, hasn't it? And um, Edith's no longer in church. And Edith has dropped out of high school. And Edith has accomplished absolutely nothing. Because we couldn't overcome in an hour a week what was being done the rest of the week at the house. And that was her being just verbally abused and beat up, telling that she was nobody and she wasn't smart, she wasn't stupid, she was stupid and she couldn't and she never would have. And you know what? That child grew up and accomplished everything her parents said that she could. And it was nothing. And it was because of the feat that she, we couldn't overcome an hour or two a week what was spoken over her the rest of the week. And it breaks my heart to this day wondering where that child's at and, and, and what kind of life she's living, knowing that she'd been berated and beat down and talked to. And some of you all understand that because maybe it was in a relationship that you were talked down to, that you were told that nobody would ever love you, that nobody, you know, nobody would ever put up with you, that uh, you, were, you weren't good enough, you weren't smart enough, you weren't pretty enough, you weren't any of that. And this condemnation comes on you and the begin- then you begin to look at yourself the way that you've been talked to and you begin to look in the mirror and say, well, maybe nobody will love me. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I didn't come from the right side of the tracks. Do you know how many lives are destroyed? Oh, they're living and they're in the world and they're, they're functional, but their lives have been destroyed by the condemnation of somebody closest to them. And so you have to understand what that is. When, that, when those voices <clears throat> come at you, and it might come to you from somebody you love the most who says that you're nothing, you're nobody, you never will, you never have, you need to understand that that is the enemy speaking to, to try to destroy your self-worth, your self-esteem. He's trying to destroy your future, your hope. He's trying to destroy all of that because you have an enemy that absolutely hates you. He wants you to die, and he wants you to go to hell. That's the really the reality of what the devil wants. That's why when you get born again, and some of you all that have been new, uh, newly born again and trust in Jesus, that's why all hells come against you because the enemy wants you to give up and to go back to the old way of living, believing that you're nothing and you're nobody. But I've come to tell you this morning, that's a lie from the pits of hell. You are somebody. You are special. The Bible says that you were created and knitted together. You were wonderfully created. God had a plan and a purpose for your life. God has a plan and a purpose for your life.
life. You have, uh, God has, uh, he comes, the Bible says, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. In the Greek, the word abundantly means, in the, uh, literally means in abundance to the full till it overflows. Let me tell you how precious and, and important you are. You are precious and important enough that the God of this universe indwelled a, a flesh body, became man who walked on this planet in the person of Jesus Christ, who endured cruelty and, and uh, death upon a cross, shed his blood for you so that you could be what you could never be without him. That he loved you enough that the Bible says, while we were still sinners, while we were still alienated from God, while we were still doing all the things that the, that the world does, when we were living like hell, God still died for us. I don't know anybody out there that would die for somebody who wasn't acting right, but Jesus Christ did. And so when you don't think you're important, when you don't think you're special, when you don't think nobody loves you, and when you hear those voices spoken over you, you remind yourself that there might not be anybody in the world that loves me in this world, but there is one that loves me that he died on a cross at Calvary 2,000 years ago for my sins, for my life, to give me a future and a hope, and his name is Jesus, and if that's the only one that loves me, I am a winner in this world indeed. Amen. So many lives have been destroyed by, by words that have been said to people. You can't, you won't, you never will, you never have. Relationships were dominating men tell their women that nobody nobody else will put up with you. Nobody else will love you but me. And then you, you go out in the world and, and you'll never find that kind of love because you're not looking to ever have anybody love you. And it's condemnation. It comes from the devil. He's trying to destroy your life. You need to take this thing called the devil really, really serious. He's not a red, in a red pitchfork in a, in a suit, red suit with a pitchfork running around. He, he's a real life individual who's trying to destroy everything about your life. That's how people get hooked on drugs, trying to escape reality. Only the thing about that is, is when the devil gets you on that, it's like a water a circle in a toilet bowl, right? Eventually, all that water does is go in a circle, but what happens to the water at the very end? It gets down in a place and it doesn't come back. That's what happens sometimes. The devil will get you in that uh, tailspin telling you you're nothing and you're nobody. Next thing you know, you've got addictions and you've got complications and you've got problems. All because you listened to words that said you weren't or you weren't good enough. And so we were reminded when we go back to Romans 8, verse 1, when we go back over there and look at that again, we're reminded that the Bible tells us that there is now no condemnation for those of us who know Jesus. What does that really mean? Here's what that really means, is that when the day we got born again, when you gave your life to Jesus, he took every negative thing that you have ever done, would ever do, and cast it, to, as the Bible says, as far as the east from the west in, in Psalms uh, 103. He took everything that you could ever do wrong and he cast it away. The Bible says to never be remembered again. Now, I want you to think about this for just a second. I want to show you something. We're going to take this piece of paper, and we're going to say that this is a list of all your sins. Here they are. Everything that you've done personally. Okay? So this is Jason's list. Smoke cigarettes behind the barn when he was a teenager. Did you ever do that? No. Uh, <laughs> you better put me, do my list. Oh. <laughs> so, I got this. I got this. Drop phone in late last week. <laughs> Did not have clocks set on proper time. <laughs> Came into the church during my sermon. Acted like it was pre-church time. <laughs> spoke to everybody she saw coming up the aisle. Does that sound about right? She ain't coming up. Yeah. So let's say this is our list. 
<laughs> this is our list of stuff that we've done. When you, we bring this list to Jesus and we ask him to forgive it, according to the Bible, this is what our list looks like. After we bring it to Jesus, it's washed white as snow. As if it ne never happened in the eyes of the Lord. He's not like one of these people. Jesus is not like a lot of us. There's two types of personalities in the world. And you need to know what they are. There's turtles and there's skunks. And one of y'all are one of each one of, one of them, right? You know what the difference is? A turtle, you can poke a turtle, poke a turtle, poke a turtle. It'll stick its head in the shell. And then eventually one day when it's tired of being poked, it lets its head out and he snaps on to your finger, to your toe, whatever, and will not let go no matter what. Now, don't say it used to be it wouldn't be to the thunder, uh, but the way it's rained around here, y'all in a world of hurt. I ain't heard thunder in a long time. A skunk will spray you and just move on. A skunk will tell you off, and some of y'all are that way. You'll just, you know, you get mad, you tell somebody off, and you move on about your life. But some of you all hold it in, hold it in, hold it in, hold it in. And then when you finally let it out, you tell us everything we ever did wrong for the last 30 years that you knew us. And you make sure that you know it and you tell it in detail because you remember every single thing that ever was done to you. Amen. <laughs> and some of y'all are married to turtles. <laughs> <laughs> some of us are, 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 are dealing with people who constantly are reminding us what we did that God has forgotten about God is looking at us saying I don't see any of it and we're over here saying yeah but here it is God said I, get, I forgave all that it's gone don't worry about it no more why would I remember all this because the devil's over here trying to beat me up reminding me of everything I ever did wrong so there's no condemnation for those that know Jesus. Your, your list is gone. Well, what if I add more to the list? You go, back to, you go back to the Lord, you ask him to forgive you. Your list looks like this again. Okay? Now, conviction is a different thing. Okay, so if you wrote this down, uh, I want you to write the definition. Conviction is from God, and its purpose is to make you more like God. Okay? Conviction comes from God, and its purpose is to make you more like God. So let's look at the passage we looked at last week, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. Apostle Paul writing to the church of Corinthians, he says, I now rejoice not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of what? Yes. Okay. So they felt guilt and they felt conviction, but their conviction didn't drive them away from God. Their conviction drove them closer to God so that they eventually did what? They repented. Okay. But that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God. So in other words, God wanted you to be have this guilt and conviction so that you might not suffer loss in any... Repentance that is without what? Regret. Leading to... Salvation. Now, do you see the difference? Condemnation's purpose is to kill, to steal, to destroy. Conviction leads to repentance, which leads to salvation. So what does this word repentance mean? I wanted to give you this today because I didn't give it to you last week. I want to give you this today. What does repentance mean? What does the word repentance mean? And so we're going to talk about that for just a minute. Um, let me see. I've got it here. Okay. Repentance um, leads to, uh, uh, produces a change of heart. This type of sorrow, repentance, is a change of heart that leads to a 180 degree turn from my previous way. Okay. 
repentance. I feel sorry for what I've done. Okay. That's feeling sorry, but that's not repentance. So some people say, well, I feel sorry about that. And they think they've repented. Repentance is not, you know, you me making you feel sorrowful during a sermon and you come and say a few words and, and then you walk out of here and keep living the same way. That's not repentance. When you repent, when you repent and ask Jesus to come in your heart, repentance is that you recognize the error of your way and you're sorry for it. And then that you've made the decision that I'm no longer going to walk that way. I am going in a different direction. What is the direction when we repent? The direction is that we're now leaving the things of the world in the way that we used to be, and we're, we're sorry for that. We're sorry for those mistakes. We're sorry for those failures. We're sorry for the way we acted. We come before Jesus and ask him to forgive us. Now, we don't walk back out of here and continue to do the same thing. The only way we're going to be repentive is if we leave out of here and start making a different decision, walking a different way. And the different way to walk is in is in, in lockstep with the Word of God, what God is asking us to do. So let's say, for instance, you have a habit of cussing people out, especially in the middle of traffic. Some of you are that way. You wake up late for work, and then you got, you, you're hurrying to get to work, I know somebody, and I won't name anybody's name, but I know somebody who works within 30 feet of their office. <laughs> and has, has been late to work twice in the last couple of weeks. Now, I would never in my life tell you that that was my wife. I would never say that. But she, Her bed is, to the office is 30 feet. But that woman has been late twice in the last two weeks getting to work. It might be because she tries to stay and wait up on me to get home at 1 o'clock in the morning and then try to be back up at 5 o'clock in the morning and get ready to go to work. And she said, you know, I think I'd like to go back out into the work world instead of working from home. I said, huh, you've done work at home long enough. You can't even get to work on time at the house. <laughs> you got no traffic. You got nothing to pick you, and you're late. You've been late twice. <laughs> but some of y'all get it, have to go to Lexington. How many of y'all got to go to Lexington to work? Okay. All right, I know. You get an election, you wake up late on, on the day, and you, you have to hustle and bustle, and, and then when you're on your way to work, every slow person on the planet is in your way that day because they knew you were late. And so the next thing you know, it, it's, what, it, it's not their fault that you're late, you woke up late, but you're honking the horn, and you're calling them names, and you're trying to get them out of your way. Because you woke up late, you're trying now to get run over them because they just happen to be in the way. And so let's say that's you and, and, and you flip them the bird and you say some words that they can't hear in your car. And, and uh, now you want to change that. Feeling sorry for that is good. And you should repent of that. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> But if you go, if you repent on it this morning and then tomorrow morning you get into traffic and you do the same thing, have you really changed? No, you have to now practice and I'm not going to cuss out everybody who's in my way because I woke up 30 minutes late. So change of mind, change of the way we're doing things. And he said, I'm glad that you have this conviction because the conviction that comes from God will change your life. So pain and guilt can lead to destructive behaviors. We cope with pain several ways. People run to drugs and alcohol. People have self-harm and there's people who are perfectionists and many other behaviors that eventually will bring death. The point is, is that we're, as believers, are encouraged to not fulfill those habits, but repent and give it to God. So I'm, I want to ask you this question this morning. And I want you to think about this because I'm out of time. Do you deal with guilt? Don't, mind, let's look, don't shake your head. Just look straight ahead. Look at me. Don't look at the, your spouse next to you and say, yeah, I deal with guilt all the time. Art, look, Becky, you look straight up here. Don't look at Art. 
Danny, I'm going to give you a pass today. You're, 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 you, you went over there on that pew, but that's the hot corner. You stay over here next week, you're fair game, all right? <laughs> you feel guilty about stuff. The question you got to ask is why? Is the devil trying to get you off track? <laughs> My guess is probably 99% of the time that we have guilt it's the devil trying to get us off track. And you have to recognize that and you have to make a decision that I will not be deterred from living my life for Christ. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know anybody else on the planet that would be willing to die for you like Jesus did. You don't know anybody. If I were honest, I would die for my wife and I would die for my children. I'm not sure I'd die for any of you all. Now, I love you, but I've pastored three churches, two before you all. And as soon as I left pastoring them, I never heard from nobody else. Quit calling me. Nobody checks on me. Why would I die for somebody that I knew that eventually it wouldn't have nothing to do with me anyways? I would die for my family. But think about this for a minute. Jesus knew. Jesus knew that he would... That People would do him like they do me when I leave a church. They don't call. They don't check. They don't say, hey, hey, we appreciate what you've done for us. No, none of that. Jesus died for the exact kind of people like that who would be too busy in their week to say thank you. They would be too busy in their week to worship. They would be too busy in their week to think about him at all, to take five seconds and pray over a meal and say, Lord, thank you for, for what you bless us with, for, for thinking that everything they got, they did it from, the, from their own hands, that it wasn't God who helped them. And so there's no gratitude, no thanks, none of that. And yet he died for all of us that do that from time to time. So Jesus is not trying to make you feel bad. He's trying to lead you to repentance, change. And not change for the sake of changing, but changing because there is something better waiting over here for you. But you'll never get it if you don't listen to the voice of God that says, do this, do that, go here, go there. Pray about this, repent about this, get saved, join the church, rededicate yourself. If you don't listen to him in those things, you'll never trust him in the big stuff. He's always working not to kill, to steal, destroy. He's always working to benefit your life. Why? Because he wants you to be a walking testimony for the goodness and the grace of God. He wants some people to be able to go out and say, you know what, God's been good to me. We, look at what, we, what we've acquired. And maybe you're sitting here today and you think, well, I ain't acquired a whole, whole lot of much of anything. You compare yourself with two-thirds or, three, or half of the world, their st standard of living, you might not have but a few dollars in your bank account. You're richer than the majority of people all, all over the planet. So we've been blessed. So when the guilt comes, and it will, if it's condemnation, you shake it off and remind yourself who you belong to. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I will not stand for this guilt, this shame. It's behind me. It's past me. It's all over with. I'll live for him. Get away from me, Satan. But if it's condemnation or conviction, God's telling you there's a better way, there's a better route, there's a better this, there's a better that. You better listen to that voice and say, Lord, I'm sorry that I haven't followed you the way I should. Today, I changed my mind and I'm turning to follow you. And there's a song that we used to sing years ago. It says, I have decided. And it says, uh, the cross before me, the world behind me. Though none go with me, I still will follow. And there's a, there's a phrase at the end of that song that says what? No turning back. Why? Why no turning back? Where else is there to go to? When you found the truth, when you found life, when you have found forgiveness, when you have found access to a heavenly realm one day, there is no place else to go. The cross before me, the world 
behind me. It's your choice today. You live guilty or you live free. And conviction will always set you free. Listen to his voice this morning. And if he's asking you to do something, get saved, join the church, rededicate your life. If he's asking you to do that, then you step out, trust him, and he will bless you in ways you can't begin to think or imagine. Let's stand on our feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. For those of you all that are in the room today and maybe you're not saved, this pew beside this piano is the place I want you to come. I want you to come and sit on this pew and I will come and lead you through the sinner's prayer. For those of you are that are in the room today and maybe you need to join the church or rededicate your life, you come to this pew as well. Maybe some of you in the room need to pray. You just come and ask God to bless you, to help you, to give you strength, to turn down the noise of the devil. But you walk out of here knowing who you belong to. You belong to Jesus and everything's going to be all right. Father, speak to our hearts this morning. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, there are people in this room that are struggling today with that voice telling them they're not good enough. But I'm here today as a messenger of the Lord on himself saying that you died for us and that makes us good enough. We no longer listen to that voice of the devil, but we choose to listen to the voice of God that said, I loved you and I died for you. Father, today, let us hear your voice and let us listen to what you're saying and let us have courage to make those decisions you're asking us to make. We ask it this morning in Jesus' precious name. Every head bowed, every eye. Decided to follow Jesus.